commentary uh, during the presentation as well. I, I love making these really interactive. And, uh, you know, this is designed to be um, that kind of small format, intimate, we're all chatting with each other, uh, trying to help each other, each other out. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to share this. We'll start with the presentation and then I will go to our meeting. Yep. All right, everyone can see that okay? Yes, perfect. All right, terrific. Um, oh, and also I would be remiss if I did not mention, and I think it is required by law to also disclose, uh, Amanda and Jeff are investors in SparkToro, um, which uh, we we are, Casey and I, my, my co-founder and I are incredibly appreciative of. We've truly appreciated your support and um, and it's it's wonderful to be able to have uh, this no offense to my prior investors at Moz but it is wonderful to have people who are in the world of web marketing right and understand the problems that we're trying to solve who are who are you know behind the company um, and I think yeah that's that's been really powerful to see a lot of people who who want the product to exist to say like hey yeah I want to I want to back this almost like a Kickstarter <laughs> Uh, slightly more expensive. <laughs> so what I want to talk about today, for those of you who are from the web marketing world, right? SEO world, social media marketing world, content marketing world, paid media marketing. A lot of times when you hear market research, I think we, we unfortunately exclusively think about surveys. And that is, in, in my opinion, a fallacy and a mistake. Um, and, and I think we should instead think more broadly about what market research can mean and the value of understanding our audience and customers. And we know this, right? In my old job at Moz in SEO world, you had to understand what searchers wanted. When they, what words and phrases were they typing in was the first question. The second question was, what do they want from the web pages that they get to? Because the, the more things that you provide that they want, the better Google would eventually rank you, right? In the early days of Google, they were not great about that. But lately, they've been getting better and better. And of course, if we're doing conversion rate optimization, if we're doing messaging, if we're doing brand building, if we're doing content marketing, we have to understand both these groups, our broader audience and our direct customers, the people who we can convert into paying subscribers or buyers of our products. So I, I want to break this down. Um, I, I've been thinking about this for a long time and trying to visualize it in my in my head and when I describe it to audiences on stage. And so finally, I put together like a, a rough kind of a Venn diagram, uh, a little amateur, but, but this idea that there are different people in your audience that are not just your customers and potential customers, right? There are also people who can amplify your work, potentially your content, your social media messages, your brand, uh, your values, your messaging, your story, what you do and who you are to a bigger audience that might not even be customers, but that still influence both current customers and potential current customers. And, and when we do audience intelligence work and market research work, we, we want to ask questions like these. I'm not going to you know, read them all off to you, but we, we break them into groups, right? We want to know information from our current customers about what made our brand resonate and what would improve their experience and what messages are most effective and how are we helping them? What is our product doing? What is it solving for them? And from potential customers, we want to figure out things like where and how we can best reach them and what could nudge their behavior, how we can earn their business, and then we have this this other group, this community and media group, right? The people who can amplify and influence customers and potential customers. And we want to know which publications and people have influence. What are the topics and stories that might resonate? How can we earn their attention? This stuff, unfortunately, even though it is core to marketing strategy, in my experience, there are a ton of brands and agencies and consultants who don't do it, who don't have this information. Right? They, 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 they don't even try and start with this. And, and I think that makes your job so much harder and so much less strategic, right? You might be nailing your marketing tactics. You might be doing a great job of you know, getting more amplification on social, getting more followers, getting more email subscribers. Uh, but 
if this data isn't available to you, if you don't have this understanding, you're almost certainly missing out on optimizing the experience as much as you could. So what do, what do, we, what do we mean when we say audience intelligence? My definition, and this is not official, but, but this is how Casey and I have been thinking of it, and I think how a broader community is starting to think about it, which is useful, usable data about your customers, potential customers, and community, right? And that useful, usable data about your customers, potential customers, and community can kind of come in three buckets. It can come in demographic buckets, right? This is, this is like classic, you know, old school brand advertising where we try and figure out like whether our demo is watching this show or that show on this network or that network so we can buy TV ads. Psychographics, this is sort of like understanding lifestyle, personality traits, uh, attitudes, values, interests. I think there's some useful data in here, although my, um, I worry that this gets too much into trying to classify people into groups when people are very much individuals and, and have ranges. It can be helpful. I have seen some stuff that's, that's useful here, but I, I find it a little too narrowing. Beha and behavioral data. I really love, I love behavioral data. I think this is because I come from an SEO and web marketing background, right? But I love data about product usage and what product usage predicts you know, stronger retention and, and recidivism in the future. Uh, sources of influence. I like seeing what sent good traffic to my site. Social media use. I like seeing the networks people are using. I like seeing what they're following and who and what they're engaging with, what people search for, where they go. I find this behavioral data missing, missing from most market research. Most market research is survey-based and it doesn't gather this stuff. And we, if you're in web marketing world, which, which probably if you're li listening to... Uh, you know, to me and to, and to Jeff and, and are here on Data Driven, you have that savviness. We're really good at this stuff. So there are ways to collect this data. Surveys, interviews, analytics, and, and behavioral data, right? So surveys, we can, we can ask people things like express preferences, we can test messages, we can ask them for self-reported traits. Self-reported data is sometimes very good, but, um, <laughs> For example, it, it, it works a little like uh, election polling, right? You you have a margin of error. Usually the data falls inside the margin of error. There's sort of a, a distribution curve, right? And occasionally people get very frustrated when the, the numbers don't align to real behavior. And I find that happens. I find that happens. Uh, interviews, right? So I anytime I do a survey, and I did this with SparkToro, right? Uh, uh, Jeff knows well, I, I sent newsletters about this, newsletters, but email updates to our investors about this. Anytime we did surveys, we also did interviews of some of those people because I wanted to get like, like the, the color and depth behind the expressed preferences and the self-reported traits and what people said they wanted and why they said that. And I, I find that either of these individually are not that valuable. If you just do interviews, right, to understand your, to try and understand your audience or understand how your product's solving a problem or understand what you can do better or where to reach people, you, you get bias, you get a lot of bias. Surveys can help remove some of that uh, bias by distributing it over, over a larger number of people, right? You have hundreds of people, hopefully, uh, taking a survey and they are hopefully a representative sample set of the audience you want to reach. And then you can do interviews with those folks. So that way, if you do 10 interviews and you hear three times, you know, oh, we really like X. And then you look at the survey data and no one liked X. Well, either something's going on with the survey or you got randomly, which is very possible, those only the only three people who really care about X. And so you, you want to add those things together. And then, of course, there's analytics data, right? Traffic sources and patterns, content performance, which, which pieces of content on your site have performed really well, areas of friction, funnel friction, and then behavioral data, right? What, what, what are uh, people, what, when we analyze our audience, right? When we, if you've ever done like a, hey, let's look at all, the, all of our customers and see what data we can gather from all of our customers. Oh, they appear to be, you know, demographically uh, these ways and behaviorally these ways. You can also look at things about their presence online 
Um, and this is what we'll talk about with SparkToro, right? Because this is what SparkToro does, is it analyzes audiences based on their online attributes, things that are in their about pages and, and social profiles and behavioral data of what they follow and where they go online, what they visit, share, engage with, all that kind of stuff. This, if it sounds like this is a little overwhelming, the reality is I, I, I empathize with you a lot, right? If you're like, oh my God, you want me to do surveys and interviews and analytics and you want me to gather behavioral data before I do any of my marketing so I can be smarter about it. Okay, that sounds really nice, but you know what? I'm not gonna do that, Rand. That is way too much work. Okay, I'm with you. I, I, I feel your pain, I totally get it. Here's, here's what I'd say. When you find friction and a problem in your marketing funnel or your, your marketing flywheel, that is the time to apply this information. And you can apply it directly to the problem that you are having, right? So if your problem is, gosh, we're not reaching a big enough audience. Well, you know what? Behavioral data uh, about your, the attributes of your customers and then finding what else influences them might be a huge solution. If you are having conversion rate optimization problems where you know, two years ago, 2% uh, or 3% of the people who visited your pricing page signed up and now it's 0.4%. And you're wondering, oh man, what, what what's going on different? Well, what's happening here? Well, surveys and interviews might be a great way to go. Analytics, looking at areas of fr funnel friction might be a great way to go. You can apply the piece that you need to solve your problem. Okay, let's talk about these core components. I cannot urge you enough to have some, at least a few real relationships with real people in your audience, right? So uh, here's uh, Ross Simmons. He's at the coolest cool on, uh, on Twitter and, um, and, and a, a consummate social media marketer and con content marketer, br brilliant guy. And Will Reynolds, who of course owns Sierra Interactive, which is, which is one of the most uh, successful you know, uh, SEO and paid search marketing firms uh, out in Philadelphia. You, you know what's funny about this photo? I, I don't know if you can tell, Jeff, but um, there are about 30,000 people in this in this photograph. Uh, this is at a Philadelphia Eagles game pre-COVID, obviously. And Rand Fishkin is the only one not wearing Eagles gear. Mm -hmm. I, I literally, as I walked through the stadium, everybody was looking at me like I was the crazy person because... I was the only person who didn't, I didn't know that when you go to an Eagles game, you have to wear the gear. Thankfully, I did not get beat up because I was with um, lots of Eagles fans. And besides they were playing the Jets. So I think- Yeah, and as long as you weren't wearing Jets gear, you're fine. Yeah, I mean, and, and um, I feel like even if I was wearing Jets gear, they'd all look at me and be like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but in any case, in any case, I, I love having real relationships with people because those allow me to get those deeper connections that surveys and even interviews can't provide, right? Like Will will be like, hey man, real talk, uh, our team switched from Moz to SEMrush for this. And I'd be like, oh shit, yeah, Th thanks for the heads up, right? And I'm not gonna get that unless I have a real relationship with them. You also are going to need statistically significant data when you do your surveys. And what I mean by that is enough people and enough of the right people. So if you're running a survey uh, and that data is coming back with a high degree of distribution of behavior, right? Like, like the responses are all over the place and there's a small number of people, you don't have a lot of confidence you, you can't have a lot of confidence in that data. And, and you do need that if you're gonna be basing decisions on it. You're gonna need a well-structured funnel that you can measure, right? That you have some way to do it. Um, this this uh, example comes from Clipfolio who actually built this dashboard based on a based on an old whiteboard Friday I did from years ago. You don't, you don't have to structure your uh, data this way, but I love thinking about it in these four segments, right? Like people are aware of my product, they first visit my website, my web properties, they return and then they convert, right? And, and this, this doesn't happen sequentially. It, it often ha is a long complex journey, but being able to see this means I can see uh, where we might be struggling, right? If traffic is dropping, is that an awareness problem? Is that a returning visits problem? Is it a first visits problem? It's hard to say unless I have uh, visibility all throughout. Uh, 
I also really recommend that if you don't already, you have some source of market-wide behavioral data, meaning like you can look at uh, how other competitors are performing in your space, not just competitors that might be uh, directly solving the same problem you do or provide the same product, but competitors for your customer's attention, right? Because one of, one of the things like when, when uh, the pandemic hit, for example, you know, back in a sort of end of February into March, a lot of folks were panicking because they were looking at their own traffic and they were wondering, is it just me? Like, am I the only one who is losing out? And of course the answer usually was no, but sometimes it was yes. And that uh, that is really important to be able to see. And there's there's lots of other questions that, that, that click stream style data can answer. I like similar web quite a bit. Uh, the other ones that you might look at if you have a very popular website and you're not familiar with them, there's a company called Verto Analytics that I just talked to. I just talked to their CEO, I think they're in um, Finland, based in Finland in the United States, but Verto, V-E-R-T-O Analytics. And they have a very impressive um, panel built audience. It's not as big as similar webs, uh, but they have uh, very perfect data about all the individuals, right? Because they, they opt into a panel on their smartphone, tablet, and all their PC, all their laptops and, and desktops. Uh, and that that data is, is pretty remarkable. Uh, oh, one more source I'm investigating. I haven't, um, haven't analyzed them yet, but if uh, if you want to, you can check them out. They're called biscience.com, uh, bi science. I should include all three next time I uh, update this presentation. But bi science, you might check them out as well. They have a pretty substantive, I think it's 1.5 million uh, user clickstream panel here in the US. And uh, they're, they're based in Israel, but have a, their biggest presence is, is here in the US. Okay. I put, I put the links in the chat so everybody can check them out. Awesome, thank you. Appreciate that. So why why does this stuff matter now? Like why are why am I so passionate? Why was Jeff so passionate about audience intelligence now? We're you know we're we're going through this pandemic situation. We're going through what looks like it may be an economic uh, you know turn of the corner, but still a massive massive downturn for the last you know five ten years of economic performance. I think the you know the reality is. Obviously, we have massive unemployment. We've got a plunge in retail sales and in services economies uh, across the board. And there's a lot of changing behavior, right? Uh, Microsoft has a really nice trends. If you haven't checked them out, uh, they have a really nice trends page where they show data like this. Similar web does as well. I also like HubSpots uh, if you're in SaaS or B2B. And, and so our product and marketing strategies have to keep up. Right? We, have, we know that our audience behavior is changing rapidly. For example, desktop behavior is on the rise for the first time since the iPhone launched. Uh, um, the amount of time we're spending online has jumped dramatically, right? Because we're all, everybody's stuck at home quarantining. And so th there's kind of four ways that I think about this, right? In, in the product world, we could think about launching new things to serve new needs. There's tons of people doing that. In pricing, we might think about being more generous or uh, offering discounts, offering uh, extended payments, right? Uh, low co lower cost packages. On positioning, we might try and think about how we would position ourselves differently because of what our customers are experiencing, right? We, we might highlight our product being a, a solution to a different problem that's newly relevant. Uh, and we might change tactics, which channels, right? Uh, wh wh where we're getting our traffic from, uh, where we're spending our, our paid ad budget. And I, I think we have to, if we wanna be competitive as the economy recovers, we have to exhaust these opportunities before we start killing budget or cutting teeth. Um, otherwise we are gonna fall behind. So let's talk a little bit about some applications here. If your company uh, on the product side or the marketing side or both use personas, I, I don't personally, I, I, um, I am not a huge fan of personas, mostly because I feel that they are an abstraction 
from the actual human being. I, I don't mind using the modeling that personas use, but I really like using real people, right? I'd, I'd much rather have like, well, here's Sierra Interactive, the agency, here's Ross Simmons, the, the, the marketer, right? Then uh, I would have, I'd much rather have that than here's whatever, marketing Mary or sales Sally. I, I, I don't, I find those less valuable for me personally. But if you're building I personas, sorry. I was gonna say, I like to, I, I, every time I write an email, I write it for a single person that I, yes. that I've met or know, because it's, you're writing for them and it's, and it's just more genuine and conversational. So I agree with you for sure. I feel that way when I'm product building too, right. Or doing marketing. Like when I'm sending a yep. tweet, when I'm writing a blog post, when I am, um, uh, sending, you know, designing an email that's going to go out to our list. I like to write it as though I know one person or a couple people who are real people who are opening that email. Like that uh, is much more meaningful to me than, oh, right, I'm writing for character the maestro who, you know, likes convenience 25% less than she likes social. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, what? Um, but yeah, uh, I, I do really like thinking about customer journey mapping. And this is something that we did do for Spark Toro informally. We didn't do nearly as formal a, a layout as what Nielsen Norman group puts together, but um, we, we basically have a, how are people gonna find our product? How are they gonna discover the problem that they're having that makes them think about our solution? How will they examine our solution and figure out whether it's right for them? How will they buy, right? And, and what will be their, their cho choice process uh, in buying? And that, that has been really valuable for us. That was really valuable for me at Moz. It's really valuable for me at SparkToro. It's valuable in every startup, every company that I help with marketing. Uh, and this data is essential, right? Audience intelligence data is essential to this process. It can be applied to both strategies and tactics. I think this might be why it's ignored is because it's such it has such broad application, right? So people um, don't think uh, don't think about it as a singular thing. They think about it as a solution to many problems, and therefore it can get um, taken off track. So on, on strategy, right? We think about we think about applying this data when we do positioning. Positioning, by the way, in my opinion, my my humble personal opinion, positioning is the uh, most ignored, powerful strategy in marketing by web marketers. Like I think offline marketers, brand marketers think about it a ton. Political marketers think about it a ton. Web marketers. <laughs> I, we, yeah, I think we have been trained, right, to think about tracking clicks and increasing traffic and increasing conversion rates and not positioning, even though positioning really helps with all that stuff. So positioning is like, uh, I think that a classic way to think about positioning is think about right now how the pandemic and the economic downturn have affected how businesses, in particular business owners and, and executive teams and leadership teams are thinking about their own budgets and their own strategy. And there's there's a huge way, right? That that, that that's changed things. It's uh, April Dunford, who I was on a on a call with um, a few weeks ago, talked about how she was advising people, which she never has before, but she was advising people because of the downturn to shift a lot of their positioning from "We will help your business grow" to "We will help your business save money." Right. You can offer the same product, same solution, but if you position it one way versus the other, you know, 90% of the time when the economy is growing, it is the right thing to do to position yourself as we will help your business grow, right? If you're B2B. But right now, it might be we will help you save money. In fact, it probably is we will help you save money. Positioning, hugely important. Promotion. Right? What's the story that we are going to tell our audience? Where are we going to amplify that message? And what's our path to earning a return from that amplification? Especially if it costs us, it almost always costs money and time. It can be applied to the funnel, right? In terms of uh, acquisition, the, the, the journey from visit to conversion, the retention and hopefully repeat purchases, right? The recidivism of customers coming back. And of course, I mean, yeah. Uh, obviously, right, it can be applied to your uh, strategy, strategic approach, right? The channels you choose to go after and, and the ones that you choose not to go after and prioritize. 
the team, how you build your team, uh, choosing growth hacks and when to apply those versus building a marketing flywheel. And it's tactical too, right? So, you know, you're advertising. I'm not gonna get into these, but your, your, your content and SEO, right? Keywords and, and media types and topics. You use your experience, right? Visual design, nav labels, featured elements, and, and CRO, right? Funnel structure, calls to action, nurturing, all of that. So let's take let's take a couple minutes and, and look at SparkToro and the audience intelligence data. I would love, by the way, um, to get some, let's see, what's the best way to do this? Okay, I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna, um, did I hear Moz is downsizing their space? <laughs> Yes, I think that's very wise for pretty much every business to downsize their space. I think there's going to be a lot of people working from home for a long time. Um, I am going to share my other screen. This one. Share. Yeah, this is um, on a uh, on a recent Moz board call. I actually I urged them to be like, I don't even think you should move into the new office. I don't think you should do the build out. Like, I know you signed the lease, but just just leave it. <laughs> yeah. Um, all righty. So, uh, by the way, perfect example, right, of of audience intelligence, right? If Moz talks surveys and interviews their team members, their whatever two hundred people who work for Moz in Seattle and Vancouver and all over. Well, when are you? When do they feel comfortable coming back to work? Do they like working from home? Are they feeling like the last three months have been more or less productive, right? And then they apply that internally instead of externally. But same, same kind of thing, right? Uh, all right. So let's um, let's use some examples here. I'll, I'll start with a you know uh, an area of market of an area of uh, audience that we are all familiar with. So let's let's start with digital marketing. So. SparkToro's product is basically uh, these these five searches, uh, search types, right? So I can say, I want to know about an audience that uses these words in their profile. And uh, let's say, right, so Jeff and I both use the words marketing in our profile. Let's use that one. And we probably use... Uh, let's try digital. So these would be people whose whose bio, right? The the words and phrases that appear in their bio on on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, right? The profile section, or their about page of their website. If we've connected those up, uh, have these two words, digital and marketing, in them. So SparkToro basically analyzes you know tens of millions of profiles, and it found fifty one thousand three hundred and sixty sources. Uh, I'm not as profiles essentially from the last 120 ish days whose profiles include digital marketing. For us, this is a very large audience, uh, very homogenous behavior. Web marketers are, are not super diverse in their behavior. They all follow, share, link to, engage with, talk about the same kinds of things. And so, like an election poll, we have we can have high confidence uh, in the data that we're about to see. So, this overview shows you a couple of things, right? It shows you uh, some samples of social accounts that are followed, right? 30% or 15,000 of these 51,000 follow my old company, Moz. It's, it's pretty good news. A lot follow Google Analytics, Search Engine Land, right? No surprise. These are some hidden gem accounts, Screaming Frog, Search Engine Roundtable, Bill Slosky. I'm personally deeply familiar with all these. These aren't hidden gems to me, but right, if you don't know a sector well, these, these really are hidden gems, right? So we do this with websites, we do it with podcasts, we do it with YouTube channels, uh, we do it with words and phrases that appear in people's bios. Uh, so let, let's actually start there. We're gonna, we're gonna start with audience insights uh, tab. This is essentially showing data about this group of people, right? So people whose profiles include digital marketing frequently have the words in them, agency. SEO, no surprise, marketing manager, marketing agency, consultant, strategist, right? And and on down the list. So I can get a real sense of like, oh, okay. It is much more likely that someone who's interested in digital marketing is interested in SEO than in email marketing, right? Almost seven times as many people. So if I am a digital marketing publication, eh, yeah, probably, right? I might think about like, mm, the ratio shouldn't be one to one. 
for the, for the content that I'm putting out, probably, right? Unless I'm trying to build a specialty in email marketing. We, and we could look at, right? We could click on email marketing instead and instead analyze that audience, right? To say, oh, actually, I want to know more about people who, oops, actually, I want, uses these words in their profile, right? People who, <laughs> I must click correctly. Oh, that's a little, this query is free. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, people who use the words in their profile, email marketing, we, we have many fewer of them, which probably suggests right, that at least in English language speaking countries, there are far fewer people who on their public profiles uh, say that they're into email marketing than say SEO or digital marketing. Right? And we can see what they follow. And this is a different group of people. I'm familiar with most of these people except for email experience, but I, you know, they are a different audience. And then we can go and learn more about the sources that influence that. Uh, you can see these little purple things means I've already put them on a list of mine um, inside SparkToro. I haven't put Moz on a list, but put these other ones on a list. And so we can see like, oh, okay, Hey, look at that. I reach, you know, 16% of people who are followed by email marketing. If you are launching an email marketing product, right, a new one, and you want to reach email marketers with your new tool, or you have a new piece of content, getting HubSpot to publish something about it, getting Ann or Jeff to publish something about it, writing a guest piece for Moz or social media today, that's going to reach a lot of your audience. That's going to reach a lot more of your audience than potentially uh, the e-consultancy, you know, uh, paid content piece that you were thinking about putting up, right? Which I, I can't remember what e-consultancy charges. I think they charged back when I was at Moz like ten or twenty thousand dollars to publish on their site. Um, I don't, I don't even know if they still offer that, right? But um, I, I might think about like, oh, but Danny Sullivan has so many more followers than some of these other people. Yeah, but. You know what? He's just, he's not as followed by email marketers. So, right? Be be aware as you're doing your promotions, as you're doing your investments, as you're thinking about, hey, should we advertise on Search Engine Journal or should we advertise on uh, eMarketer? And the answer is, well, we're probably going to reach more people on eMarketer that are interested in email marketing, right? Who who say that they do this professionally. So let's think about if they're the same price. That's probably the better bet. Right. And then we might say, OK, I'm I'm already deeply familiar with this audience. Like, you know what? Can I can I see like those hidden gems? And and you can do that. So we can say, I only want to see hidden gems, essentially uh, accounts that have high engagement and a solid number of followers, but aren't necessarily mainstream. Right. So the, the millions of, of collective social followers are going to fall away and we're going to see people who have tens of thousands, but still reach a high percent of this audience. Litmus, Litmus is a gold mine, a gold mine, followed by 14% of the audience. But this is not a big group of people like that is high effective targeting. Chad White at emailmarketingrules.com. Oh, man, I would definitely put him on this list, right? These are these are kind of those golden opportunities for whatever pitching a, a, a guest appearance, a sponsorship, uh, whatever kind of marketing you're going to, you want to do, right. Getting a guest piece. Spark Tour does the same thing in websites, right. Showing percent of audience that, that follows, engages, amplifies, uh, same thing in podcasts, right. So the marketer podcast, search engine journal show, this old Mark, right. Uh, Joe Polizzi's no, no surprise there. YouTube channels, right? Similar, uh, similar stuff showing which YouTube channels that you might potentially want to advertise on or try and get on uh, or try and pitch or try and see what content they are producing that's being successful for them with those audiences. And right, then we can learn more about that email marketing audience like we did before. For example, if when the pandemic dies down, you are thinking about, hey, where should we launch our event? Well, Chicago is not much worse than New York, and it's a lot cheaper to hold an event there. I might think about doing Chicago. That's probably where I do my event. If I were in, if I were doing an email marketing event, this data says to me hmm, it might not be bad. Atlanta might be great too, right? Those are those are real opportunities. So, in any case, this type of data, um, and I'm happy to to run 
uh, some searches if, if folks want to suggest some. Jeff, maybe you can tell me if there's any suggestions in the comments. Um, but if there's an audience you'd like me to analyze and, and show off, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, we can do this for literally uh, almost any, any describable yeah. audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there are some questions more about the data collection. So I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on that for a second. But um, one thing I wanted to say is I, one of the initial things that was tough for me was I, I would I always do a search for like analytics or Google analytics. And then, if, and, and I think you just, you just showed this as well. It's like when you're in the industry deeply, you sort of already know everybody and it's like, okay, well, you're just, it's, it's almost like confirming what you already know. Um, right. You already know that, that these people are there because you've been to the conferences, you've, you've talked to them or, you know, you have a relationship of some sort. Um, David put in here that he'd like to see IT security. And so I think that'd be really cool yeah. to see that because I know nothing about IT security. Um, so it'd be cool to see what's in there. Actually, a bunch of them are coming in now. So I'm getting- Great, great, great. Um, yeah, let's, let's, run, let's yeah. run a few. Uh, but okay. one, like one thing I would point out, Jeff, right, is when you know the industry deeply, you often make bias, I know I do, I make yeah. biased decisions about what I think everyone is paying attention to, right? Yeah, and so I, sure. when I go and look at the websites tab here, I'm like, oh my gosh, really? I thought Search Engine Journal was like very SEO centric. I would not have thought of them for web marketing. Yeah. Or, or sorry, for web analytics, right? Even Moz. Moz is very SEO centric, like sort of surprising. I mean, cowshit.net, I expect to see up there, right? Click Z, I expect yep. to see there. Uh, oh, Simo. Shoot, I would have forgot about him, right? Like that yeah. that's what happens, right? So anytime I have a, a, a project that I'm launching, I still want to go through this data because it is so um, so useful to get it all in one place. And it's just easy, right? I can whatever, you know, click these and be like, yep, yep, yep. That's those are the ones I want. Um, so yeah, let's go. Uh, uses these words in their profile. We, we can do frequently talks about as well. Frequently talks about usually gives you a broader, like the broadest group of people um, because frequently talks about will look for, you know, it'll look through uh, uh, blog posts, it'll look through Instagram posts, it'll look through Twitter posts, uh, LinkedIn posts if we can crawl them, uh, public Facebook page posts if we can see them. But you can see, right, so 72,000 uh, people, sources who frequently talk about IT security, they amplify and visit these websites. Um, and yeah, I know, I've heard, I know of Tech Republic. Dark reading sounds interesting. I don't know if this is, um, uh, hopefully this resonates with, with uh, the person who asked about it, but it looks, right, SC Magazine, Naked Security, the Krebs on Security. Okay, I've heard of, I've heard of uh, Krebs. So that, like, that one resonates with me. Uh, threat post, right? It, so I have the sense that these are the right ones. If, if I wanted to do something creative, like, hey, let's do some podcast sponsorship. It's super cheap. Like it's super cheap and it reaches big audiences. That's a great way to do branding. Boom, right? This um, Sans Storm Center, Smashing Security, AAEM. Um, this, these are high numbers too, especially for podcasts. Podcasts in double yeah. digits is like, uh, is unusually high. Um, YouTube, right? Okay, so a lot of the Kaspersky Russia. I am guessing these are Cyrillic <laughs> char characters. I will uh, let Casey know about that. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say somebody did it. Just asked like right a second ago. Does this is it um, available in other languages, or how does it work from a multi language perspective? Yeah, the the bad news is right now uh, of those uh, we have about seventy five million profiles and. Uh, less than 10% are non-English language. So there's like, there's some, there's some German, there's some Spanish, there's some other languages. I think um, a friend of mine, uh, Christian Marhauksen, do you know him from uh, from Iceland? Actually, I think he's in Oslo now, but he, okay. he was running some searches with me and was like, oh yeah, you have some data in Norwegian. Like, oh, I guess, what, okay, cool. So it, it's small, right? The numbers are yeah. gonna be small, I think. Um, like what, what's the what's the German word for car rental? It's um, while you're searching for it, I'm going to say that Rand. Um, I was I was in Germany with Rand, and he and he did like a whole speech in German, and I was like, this guy can do everything. It was amazing. He like did you emceed an entire conference or like a award ceremony speaking German? It was hilarious. I, Jeff, I don't know if you remember, but the best part of that. The best part of that whole ceremony, right? They invite me to, to do the um, <laughs> award ceremony uh, in Germany. 
and uh, and and Marcus is like, oh my gosh, this is amazing! Like the American is the only one who's who's speaking German up here, and uh, and I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, if you want someone to speak German, you gotta hire the Jew, <laughs> and and like the the audience <laughs> went dead quiet, right? Because like, I think in Germany it's not funny yet, <laughs> like is it? <laughs> Except for the table of British people who are laughing hilariously, which um, I don't know. I, I was invited me I, back, I was, so I think I, I'm okay. I didn't know if you were going to say that, but that's what I, that's what I, that's the most memorable part for me too. And Amanda, Amanda's actually brought that up a few times. She's like, "That was amazing." So yes, I, that was very memorable. Uh, so yeah, you can see, right? We have very few sources who talk about German car rentals as such. The data looks super broad, not not ideal, right? Um, we don't, by the way, you can see here, we don't. Uh, Spartoro doesn't charge query credits if we don't have enough sources. Okay. So you can feel free to like try a bunch of things, and if we don't have the data, uh, we'll get it in there. Were, were there a couple of others that folks wanted to try? Um, AR marketing. Ron, Ron AR? says that. AR like augmented reality, or yeah, so it might, it might be better with augmented reality. I'm not sure if that's. Well, I guess we don't know it that well, so maybe we'll see what the. Yeah, they can let's see. Evaluate. I'll try people who do it in their profile first. Oh, yeah, we've got a lot of sources. This uh, looks very marketing and less AR to me. Um, yeah, I maybe, it's because if, maybe it could be like like Spark Tor would probably might fall. Yeah, as I say, maybe it's. A so I might try. Uh, I might try putting it in quotes to get only accounts that are, um, you know, that have that phrase exactly, and much smaller audience, right? And and look at the data, right? VR Scout, Google AR VR, Oculus, Rob Crasco. So yeah, right? You, you get way more specific with these. Um, and I didn't mention this earlier, but you know, if, for example, I were like, oh, yeah, yeah, Rob, Rob Crasco, actually that, he really reaches, I don't know him, but he really reaches the audience that we're trying to reach. Like if they listen to him, that's, that's exactly who we wanna reach. You can click analyze social audience and it'll look at, right, we have his Twitter, we have his LinkedIn, and we have his Medium. Uh, it'll analyze the uh, p the sources we've seen follow or engage with uh, with his social accounts. It's using Twitter, but uh, SparkToro connects up all of them. So when you plug in a Twitter account, any social account that we have that's connected is automatically uh, included in that. And then you can see like, oh, right? So people who engage with Roblom VR also follow and amplify these accounts, right? And so you might think about targeting these as well. Like it, those could yeah. be good websites and, and social accounts to go after. Um, and they look pretty, right? Futurism, VR focus, upload VR. Uh, was there one more maybe we should try? Yeah, cosmetic surgeons just, that, that one looks interesting too. Cosmetic surge. oh, okay. This is an excellent example of, so if cosmetic, let's say, I put an S, uses these words in their profile, cosmetic surgeons. You will see that those, uh, that that will tend to bring back data about profiles that have the plural instead of the singular. Mm. And if I'm a cosmetic surgeon, I'm very unlikely to use the plural in my profile. But if I'm a, um, let's say a business that is trying to reach cosmetic surgeons or a business that offers products to cosmetic surgeons or talks about them, then I have the plural in my profile. So I really recommend if you are looking for sources that influence cosmetic surgeons, you search for the singular, um, right? Like I, I, if I search for um, marketing professionals, same thing as opposed to marketing professional. Okay, so plastic surgery, okay. real self, no surprise there. Is there two versions of real self? Oh yeah, fascinating. Um, new beauty, allure, smart beauty guide. So these these look very cosmetic surgery centric, right? And and what's cool here is someone might say, hey, I I don't know if you've ever seen this, but like I call it the Wall Street Journal pro problem where like a CEO walks into a room and the CEO is like, all right, how are you gonna get us in the Wall Street Journal? I want our ads running in the Wall Street Journal. And your response is like, we, hey man, we know that the Wall Street Journal does not reach our audience. That's not where our yeah. customers are. And, and SparkToro is awesome for solving that problem or at least bringing data to the argument, right? Cause you can say, oh, 
yeah, you want to run a big ad in whatever it is. Uh, I, I had a client spend a half a million dollars on the New York Times when, when exactly. for that, like they're like that. I read the New York Times. I don't care. Half a million dollars. And I was like, you can get a lot more bang for your buck by, by going elsewhere. But so yeah. someone, right. So someone might say like, Hey, I want to be in the well blog on the New York Times. That's where I want to be. And you would say, yeah, well, that's read by 4%, 4% of our audience. You can triple yeah. that. You can quintuple that by getting in newbeauty.com. Yeah, I mean, it, it's tremendous how, I mean, you've aggregated or, or compiled the data that, that this would be something that I'd have to spend a week trying to figure out to refute that argument. Like if I wanted to, if I wanted to win that argument, yes. it would take a week to pull it all together. Well, and you, I mean, in, in, invariably, they'd be like, fine, run a survey. Show me the yeah. survey data. And then you'd be like, oh my God, I have to assemble a survey panel. Are you kidding me? Right. And that's, that's six weeks minimum. So yep. yeah. That, that, that's the traditional way that you'd have to do it. Uh, should we do some Q and A? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I got, I got a lot of Q A coming in. Um, do I'm, I'm just like, there's so many questions on here. Um, one, one person marks that he wanted to see um, if you could do herbalist. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I'd be just interesting to see if that's or, or specifically training, but um, I don't know if that would be a good search or not, but the herbalist or, or herbalism. Yeah, so we, so we could do both, right? What's interesting is you could say uses these words in their profile herbalist, and that's going to be people who like they think of their profession as being, er I'm an herbalist, okay. right? And they follow these kinds of social accounts and websites and podcasts, right? There's also frequently talks about herbalism and those I might see, be people yep. who are more interested in like the hobby, right? Or, or I do this on the side or I'm just passionate about it, but I'm not necessarily a professional. I don't call myself that. So way bigger group, right? And as we go down, you can see that the sources are broader, right? They're mm -hmm. less herbalism industry specific and more like general right men's health and and mercola and organic consumers michael pollan right the the indefensive yep. food guy so yeah um excellent that's a, that's a great search actually great yeah really that, 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 this i think this is where it shines at least from my perspective is is in it's i mean there's so many things that it can do but it's it's the research that you'd have to do on your own it's the 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 surfacing things that you probably didn't think about and then it's confirmation of the things that you knew about like if your plan was yeah. was staying i should do this then validation is sometimes all that we need right like usually and, and some people from my saint thomas class are on this call um and, and i just talked about this last week when i was or two weeks ago at the university and i was basically saying that sometimes you know what's right but you just need somebody else to tell you that it's right and sometimes you need somebody who's not in your organization to bring an idea or to confirm that idea yeah and so that could be a good way to do it I mean, to, you know, to be totally honest, like I see a ton of people who basically take this and they're like, oh, yes. And they just take a screenshot. Right. And they they go like that and they put it in their presentation. Right. Copy yep. paste right into their PowerPoint and boom. Right. So suddenly, suddenly ah, the sky's open and the budget, you know, the, the checks yep. start getting written and like budget flows to the right places. SEOs put their efforts into link building the right places.
are one of the hardest things to get in SEO and often cost you just as much as writing the content in the first place. So one of the big things is to know where you're linking, right? Most people who have content don't actually know what content converts to their site. So for example, you may have 100 blog posts and you see, you're like, okay, we get 20 leads a month from these blog posts. <coughs> now, one of those blog posts may be sending you 15 leads a month and the rest may be sending you five. And this is a problem that I see across almost every company that I work with is that they don't have enough granular data to understand where their conversion is coming from. So this is an example. I have this client that had around 70,000 new users a month. And what I noticed is that they also had around 150 blog posts. And they were putting out new blog posts every month with the idea that all their leads were coming in from blog posts. And when I looked at the data, it was true. I said, wow, you know, all your blog posts sent you most of your leads. It seems like you should be producing more blog posts on these specific topics where these leads are coming in from. But as soon as we set up complete attribution where we understood where their customers came from, we found out that their customers were coming from a couple pages, so just service pages primarily, they only received 1,000 visitors a month. So their 64,000 visits a month on their blog only sent them, I would say, about 20% of their customers. And that's where they were double downing on, rather than these service pages that sent them 1,000 visitors a month. So if you're not looking at your analytics and you don't understand the full attribution, oftentimes you're making the wrong decision. Um, it's very, very hard to keep producing content if you cannot track it back to, hey, does this provide ROI? And the worst part about it is that, you know, oftentimes you're seeing leads and you're saying, okay, well, chances are that's probably gonna turn into a customer. But as you get, as your company grows, you'll find out that there are, there's certain pieces of content that convert and it makes sense. Like for example, a service page, what do service pages rank for? So they often rank for, let's say, uh, CMS software via service page or hire a developer, that's a service page. Things with direct intent, people are looking to buy. And if you have a how-to post, it's not necessarily service oriented, but it's close, but is it? what's the difference in actual customers it's going to bring in? And even though a lot of this content, again, gets tons and tons of visitors, views, that really doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. Like I'd rather have a blog with a thousand visitors a month that brings in 80% of the clients that I'm going to get than, uh, than the situation that I saw here. So let's jump into Google Optimize. So one of the things that you can do with SEO um, is one, you bring in traffic, you can bring in new customers, but if you don't optimize your site, then none of that's going to happen. And I would like to say that SEO is an end-all be-all in terms of getting people to convert, but it's simply not true. Like you need growth skills and you need to be testing. So I recommend always be testing whether certain buttons are leading to convergence, whatever it may be, and setting this up through what's called Google Tag Manager. So setting up events and understanding you know, where people are clicking is huge for you and what's going to convert based off different segments and also personalizing the journey. So one of the things I've been working on a lot recently is saying, okay, if someone goes to this blog post about let's say product manager interview questions, and then they go to our homepage. Do we just give them the regular homepage copy or do we personalize it for that journey? So SEO is about understanding your entire funnel and then personalizing it so it leads to conversion. And that requires some growth skills, but if you're an early stage company, well, let's say 50 employees or less, this is something you can focus on in your role. And this is something you can probably get uh, a little leeway to go and do. If you're a bigger company, you're definitely going to struggle, but at smaller stages, you can work on all these things and set up so you have a very strong foundation for your entire customer journey. So here's something that I created. Uh, I, I don't want to say I created it. Uh, I got it from another SEO strategist and it's been super helpful. So when it comes to SEO, I like to think 36 months ahead of time and say, will this provide me value in 36 months? That sounds absolutely crazy, but I think it's something you have to do. And what we do here with this link building ROI sheet, and you can email me after, I have an email on the last side and to get this sheet. 
enables you to project how much revenue you're going to make from having backlinks point to certain posts. Now, it's not, I would say it's not like 100%, right? Nothing in SEO is 100%. It's all based on correlation. So by having that revenue per visitor and being able to plug it into this spreadsheet, what you get at the end of the day is an understanding of how much, how much uh, traffic and how much value and how much revenue you're going to get by building links if you know your cost per link as well. So this is a little bit hard. Most people do not know their cost per link. It takes a lot of experience in SEO and actually having really good um, team in place, maybe connections, whatever that may be, to understand your average cost per a link. And for me, it took about two years to understand my average cost per link is about $90. And then I say, how many links can I get a month? And you know, what is the trap, what is the domain um, hook? the domain authority that I'm trying to close so I can rank my pieces better. And through that, I can understand, okay, this is the amount of revenue that I'm going to bring in. So this is actually a real example here that I did for a client. And as you can see, I was able to project just based off understanding their revenue per visitor that we would be able to get an additional $451,000 a month over the span of 36 months by getting additional links to certain pages. So absolutely crazy. But if you work in SEO, and if maybe you're talking to investors, and you're trying to get them to understand and buy into your vision, it's an absolute must that you're able to do very strong projections in SEO. Even if there's a lot of variables that go into SEO and it's not always exact, it's important that you can at least have clarity in discussing with them so they have some understanding of where you're trying to go. So here's some fun things that I'm up to recently. So one of the things I've been doing is ranking for Uber Eats promo code, Airbnb coupon code, because uh, the whole COVID situation has me a little cooped up. So I was like, you know, what can I get for free? So here I just want to show you some of the cool things that you can do with SEO in terms of actually enabling you to get exactly what you want through, whether it be like affiliate marketing or whether it's just free Airbnb for life or Uber Eats for life. So I also have this for a couple other coupon codes. And what I did is I just dove into Ahrefs and I said, you know, can I even rank for this? Turns out you can. So I started about two months on this project, two months ago on this project, and my Uber Eats coupon code page has almost hit the first page for that keyword. And the best part about it is I'm already having referrals coming in. And then same with Airbnb, it's moving up in rankings and a couple other coupon pages. And it was a total side project, but when I looked at it, in terms of ROI, having free travel and free food for the next maybe 10 years of my life is some huge ROI there. Um, it's very hard to calculate actually how much that is. It's, um, but it's just fun things you can do through SEO, right? And that's why I love it. It's you look at your life and you say, you know, what are things that I want for free? Now, can I become an affiliate marketer of that? Can I sell it and can I help promote it? And then you get the product for free and you make money um, from doing it over a continuous amount of time until someone outranks you eventually. So, you know, leaving off this topic, you know, one of the things that I just want to share with you is that SEO is a lot of building not just an ecosystem of better sales funnels, but also having fun. If you can't have fun while you're doing it, then there's really no point to doing it. So, find out what you want for free. Find out where, what ecosystem you're trying to build around you, whether that's to have you know, multiple companies in the product management space, or whether that's to have uh, the best company in the CMS space, whatever that may be, and figure out how to build that ecosystem stronger and tie it in together, because it's all very, very possible, especially if you have, one, a great sales funnel, two, better product market fit, and you understand your leverage and can reach out with that leverage and start conversations around it. So I want to leave you guys there, um, and happy to jump into any questions now. Awesome, that was fantastic. Can we have uh, Eli back on and let's uh, let's take some questions. Um, first thing, there's a lot of questions around tools, so let's bucket that, right? Any low budget or free tools you recommend for SEO from like keyword research to tracking attribution and so on? What are your uh, thoughts there? So uh, it, the Google Search Console is my favorite all around tool and it's absolutely free. So I like Google Search Console because it's like Google gave you access to their own Google Analytics. 
the coolest thing you get from Search Console you're not going to get from any other tool is Google's data. So uh, it's giving us high clicks, which uh, if anybody's trying to marry clicks with what they see in their analytics platform, whether it's Google Analytics or logging or anything, it's not going to match up, never. However, what you can see from Google Search Console is the number of impressions you're getting on Google, and that's despite whether people click through or not. So you can see your potential visibility. And what I like from that is you can see the kinds of keywords people search in real time. And uh, you know, I mentioned some of the clients I worked with. So I, I work with brands that are verbs. So like WordPress is a verb. I worked with SurveyMonkey. Uh, I worked with GetAround. So kinds of big brands. And it, what's fascinating is to see how many people actually search that word versus what the keyword research tools say. And it's not even close. Like this is what Google's telling me the amount of people that search that brand per month, which are big enough that people create all sorts of things around those brands. And it will never match up to the keyword research tools say. So like. From uh, apples to apples, like every Google's inaccurate for every single website, and you're never going to get that, you know, from any other tool that you pay for. And then, um, you know, Josh mentioned Ahrefs. I'm a big fan of Ahrefs for crawling. I like Oncrawl, and uh, Rank Ranger is sort of like this Swiss Army knife, also fairly cheap, where you can get, you know, research tracking. Local is something that's pretty interesting there. And, and if anybody wants to ping me, and I'll, you know, get you better deals on anything. Awesome, Josh, how about you? And, and for everyone listening on the call, what we'll do is we'll put together a list of tools and the resources uh, that Josh and Eli provided, and we'll, we'll put it as part of the uh, recap blog post. And so one of the ones I wasn't mentioned is Queerscope. Queerscope is my, one of my favorite tools. It, it relies primarily on correlation analysis, so it looks at what's ranking, let's say, in the top 30, and it says, and it's coming out with a lot of new features which are gonna be really cool, so for example, if I write a post that's about RMG taxes and I don't link to the IRS, it's not going to rank me. Um, I'm going to be confused. I'm like, why isn't Google ranking me? And it's because I didn't link to the IRS. So ClearScope is coming out with a lot of that type of correlation analysis, which will tell me that data. So the science is getting very, very exact in how to rank. Um, and it's not always right. There's no end-all BR tool. It's like, especially when it comes to like traffic numbers, that's one thing that I don't know if something's if there's ever going to be a tool that has really good traffic numbers, I've been hoping for that for a while. Uh, but in terms of correlation analysis, that's become pretty popular over the last year and a half. And ClearScope is my go-to tool for that. Awesome. And you better be uh, linking to Boast as well for R&D taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, there, there are a couple of questions on backlinking, like you know, determining domain authority, PR, um, and also how do you, any hacks or tips to get a large volume of uh, backlinks from good websites. So diving into this, one of the things that I realized is the best way to do it is just to understand how much you should be paying for backlinks. Backlinks are gonna cost you money like one way or another, whether that's having people reach out, whether that's paid writers, whether that's paying for guest posts. And sometimes if you have a great product, there are other ways to get it. Uh, but if you do not have a great product or maybe you've exhausted reaching out and trying to exchange products, then oftentimes you're going to have to pay for it. So one is to understand the data behind actually ranking your, for a certain keyword, whatever that may be, and how much revenue that's going to bring in and making projections around that. And then working your way backwards and saying, okay, now that I know that, I can spend this much money on backlinks to get there. Um, and what is the best way for me to do that? And that's then going to give you, you know, a number of options and hopefully a number of options, or it may just give you an option to say like, okay, we got to spend quite a bit of money on paying for these links. And I know there's a lot of talk in the SEO world about how paying for links is sort of looked down upon, but in some way you're always paying for links, whether that's through human capital or literally just, you know, exchanging money. So I'll echo that, that you, do, you do always have to pay for links, but the cost is just divided differently. So I, I mentioned a PR agency earlier, so they work on Retainer. Um, that's another one, ping me, I'll get you an intro and they'll, they'll, they'll be nicer to you. Named is Adigy. And you pay them on Retainer and they're getting links, which if you divide the amount of links you get for that Retainer, you're, you're paying per link. Um, I've also done some really successful campaigns, this is at SurveyMonkey, around surveys and creating content that went viral and then got a bunch of links. So in order to make that content go viral, I had to advertise for it on Facebook. And like there was a total cost for my campaign, which came down to a cost per link. Uh, there, part of your question was around uh, domain authority and deciding the value of links. 
So I think there's it, it's demand authority is just kind of a, a raw score, and I don't necessarily trust that for deciding whether a link's good. So like you might say, uh, let's say Inc.com is demand authority. I don't know. Let's say 80. But if you get a link that Google will never find, it's completely worthless. Whereas if you get a link on another site that Google's going to find and people, other people are going to link to, that link is far more valuable. So there's sort of like a, a logical component to this. I will say the best link I ever got was, I uh, did this a couple times, I got it from uh, the White House. So two ways I got the link. One was, uh, this is that SurveyMonkey. One was uh, SurveyMonkey did a partnership with the White House and the White House linked to the wrong page. So. Uh, I was able to recover that link by building a page for the page the White House linked and then use that as magical link juice to just kind of run through the entire site. And the other time I got a link from the White House is uh, this was the uh, Commerce Secretary, somebody at, somebody at the White House ripped off a post that I'd uh, participated in writing at SurveyMonkey and they, they backlinked the post they ripped off. So they made it look like SurveyMonkey had authored something on the White House and that's pretty powerful. Yeah, that, that is pretty powerful. There were a bunch of questions around site speed and how does Google determine site speed is important for your, for your website and how do you uh, guys factor that in? I think there are so many variables that go into Google determining whether site speed is important that there is no one variable and I wish I could say that there was. I think you know sales cycle is important and Google's really understanding your sales cycle in terms of do people go to your website and purchase right away? Do they need to look at like three review posts before they purchase? and understanding that um, and it's and I think there